so much for coming to Catholicon. We are always delighted to, to see old friends, make new friends, friends of friends. Your friends are our friends. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, but right now we're doing something. There's a Catholicon original. We're having an author of a book that has just been published by Oxford University Press. Answer all your questions about everything, but in particular about the book. Now, if you know Robin or if you don't know Robin, let me tell you a bit about Robin Hansen. So, let me, let me tell you the difference, the difference between Robin Hansen and a normal economist. <laughs> so, a normal economist tells me all about his work, and I sit there and listen, and say, yeah, maybe, and then I forget about what they told me. Robin, on the other hand, tells me something that he's working on, and say, that's crazy, that's ridiculous, it's absurd. Tell me more. <laughs> Let's talk about it every day for the rest of our lives. It's amazing. It's Wrong, but amazing. <laughs> Sometimes, of course, Robin turns out to be right, and then it's even more amazing. Now, for many years, I was worried that Robin would actually never write a book and would allow his brilliance to just go down in the blogosphere, which is great. But I was sitting here hoping, come on, Robin, we need to put Hansonism on regular paper so that we read by regular people. And now it has been done. So, I give you the great Robin Hanson. Thank you. Thank you so So, I know you're all here mainly for gaming. I'll say a few things. We'll open it for questions. I will not feel at all bad if you start to wander away because you're bored with the subject. But those who are interested, we can keep talking. And then in a while, there'll be a cake. Yes. Uh, but you can probably eat the cake. <laughs> So you have the foggiest idea what it is, and then we can ask questions and discussions. So, the key idea here, I used to hang out with futurists and science fiction folks. That was a lot of fun. Those people know a lot of technology sometimes, and they don't know much social science. So, when they spin out scenarios, futurist scenarios or stories, they usually have sometimes impressive physics and other engineering, and the social science is just laughable. And I always thought that was a shame, so my very first year of graduate school in 1993, the very first Christmas vacation after taking the introductory classes, I decided to sit down and apply standard microeconomics to a particular scenario that people had talked about in futurism. And I wrote a paper about that, and then I published it uh, the year later, not a very impressive place, and then I mostly left it alone because I was hoping other people would do something and I needed to get tenure, etc. And nobody ever did anything. And later on I decided I needed to focus, like Brian said, I needed to focus and write a book so I had to have something that would last. And I'd heard that half the people who get a book contract never deliver a book. And I needed something that would suck me in and make me interested enough to starve all my other children so that this one child could get enough attention to grow up. <laughs> and so I chose the topic, not necessarily the most important one, but the one that would most suck me in. The one that has this most fascinating detail. It's almost like a science fiction scenario. It is like a science fiction story, except there's no characters and no plot. It's just <laughs> the setting. And the setting makes sense. That is, all the way through for 350 pages. It all makes sense. So the scenario is called uploading or brain emulations. Uh, it's a staple in science fiction and futurism. It goes way back. What if you took a particular human brain, you scanned it, you made a computer model of that brain so that it had all the same input-output behavior, then you could hook it up with hands, eyes, ears, and mouth, and it would act exactly the same in the same situations, but since it's on a computer, you could run it fast or slow, you could copy it, you could put it in strange environments, and all those things could happen. And basically, I've tried to analyze how would the world change if you could do that cheaply? Not just uh, how would a few interesting things change for a dramatic story, but all the way through. And so some of you might think, that's impossible, and you guys probably don't believe social science exists, which is what most like technologists and futurists think. They don't think social science exists. Uh, but in a sense, all I'm doing is, so my claim is all I'm doing is straightforwardly applying standard theory. That is, I go area by area through lots of different fields of academia, and I just take our most straightforward theories, and I just apply them to this scenario, and I say, what would they say about this? And I do that over and over and again, and I collect lots of different implications, and it adds up to a big picture. So if you think theory exists, reminder, the reason you have theory is because you want to predict stuff that isn't in the data you have, right? You have data, why not stick with the data? And Robert why not giving himself enough uh, credit here because the theories he chooses to work with are ones that are really, you know, 
there's an awful lot of economists who could go off and write theories uh, that would uh, right. that everyone would just go and. Right, so I'm just trying to take straightforward standard theories, but yes. I happen to have an unusual background. I, I did physics, I did computer science, I did some engineering, I did political science, I, did, I teach law and economics, and so I have an unusually wide background, so I can just draw on all that and put together a straightforward theory. And so the, the two main kinds of flack I get, I would claim, are there's, uh, there's technologists say this scenario is possible, but there's lots of other people saying, that's bull. That couldn't happen, so my presumption that this technology scenario is plausible, is questioned by lots of other people who don't study technology scenarios, they study other things, they say they couldn't possibly know that that sort of thing is plausible. Then on the other hand, there are people who think that technology scenario is plausible, but they think social scientists couldn't possibly tell you what would happen in a world like that. Nobody knows that sort of thing because social science basically doesn't exist. So I'm trying to combine these two obvious applications of different fields People in the technology area who say, yeah, that's a plausible technology scenario. And people in social science who say, yeah, we could figure out things about that sort of scenario. We have social science. So that's this book, and it's chock full of this sort of thing. And I'm trying to make it sound very plausible, but it's not anything anybody else has ever wanted to do. <laughs> Even while people hear it or maybe doing it, nobody was saying, oh, I got to do that too. And I was racing to a deadline to get there first. No, there was no race. <laughs> nobody else wanted to do this. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure that I'm weird and unusual in even thinking of doing this, but it seems straightforward to me. So that's as much as I'll say in introduction. Again, happy to take questions and comments. If you want to wander off it because it gets bored, I will not feel bad. Uh, there's this, there, I do have, I will sell a box of these books at $20 each. There are 24 on Amazon, 35 list. I'll sign it. And I've got a stack of cards out there for advertising. So that's my intro. So I think this is probably the like most common non-standard bit of flack you get. But if I believe in like the technology, and I believe in the social science, it seems to me like one limit you put on this technology is this idea of we're not going to have much ability to muck with the inner workings of like how minds work. We're not going to be able to like split people apart into their constituent parts and like just use those parts. So several things to say. One is. The future should be as important as the past, in fact, more because we can do something about it. If it was worth having 100 books on the future, which is vastly less than the number of books we have in the past, it would be worth having a book about each scenario that had a 1% chance. So I don't need a high probability of this scenario to make it worth writing this book, especially if I could say this is a demonstration of just showing you how much you could say. So that's one thing to say. Second is, most theorists look for their keys under the lamppost. That is, what we do as theorists is we make simplifying assumptions as needed to get concrete, clear results. Yes, that's what theorists do. And so I've tried to show, choose plausible but simplifying assumptions that should at least be valid in part of the future scenario. So this, I think, is a perfectly reasonable. The first moment we can make emulations, they're probably just a mess. We don't understand them. And at that moment, at least, we'll be limited in what we can do with them. But we can still do a lot, and I can describe a whole scenario. Then, later on, eventually, probably we figure out the spaghetti code and are able to do more with it. I don't actually think it makes that much difference. I think most of the scenario just goes through, even if you can make substantial changes. But nevertheless, for simplicity, I just set those aside in my main analysis, and I worked it through as a simplifying assumption. Another standard simplifying assumption, I should admit, is supply and demand. I tend to assume, like most of us economists do, as our first cut, supply and demand, i.e. high levels of competition, low levels of regulation. That's not to say that there should never be regulation. It's to say that's the standard thing we do as a first cut. And it is a reasonable first cut. That is, when we think of the past, when we think of foreign nations, we often use supply and demand as our first cut way to think about things. And that's what I'm doing, too. And we know what to do as the next third and fourth cuts, et cetera, uh, after we have supply and demand. But yeah, but theorists, you have to pick simplifying assumptions. I want to talk about the Terminator. So. Yeah, you, you know Sarah Connor? Yeah. She, she wrote my first review of the book. <laughs> Actually true. Yeah. There's a woman called Sarah O'Connor of Financial Times. <laughs> She's the author of the first public mainstream media review of the book. <laughs> so Go figure. 
Did she wish you hadn't published it? <laughs> no, she, she had great books. Great reviews. She liked it. So, uh, under what situation do M's and regular humans get in conflict? Uh, so, first of all, you can, what humans initially have to do is retire. Basically, they lose their ability to earn wages, but they can still have other assets. So, how do we have conflicts with our retirees? Well, implicitly, they own capital and we let them spend it. So, implicitly, there's a conflict we could say, you know, we can all go, let's kill all the retirees and take their stuff, because what are they doing for the rest of us, right? So, there's that implicit conflict that the humans are there living off their retirement investments, and the emulations could resent that and say, why don't we take your stuff? So, that's a kind of conflict. Uh, another initial conflict would be when the first emulations are first possible, very high growth rates are possible. And so probably most of the regimes in the world, places, will think, oh, this is interesting, we need to study this. And they will have commissions and reports and thinking about how this should be handled. And basically, the few places that basically allow whatever it does, probably, maybe even out of neglect, maybe not because they think it's necessarily, those places will suddenly boom, grow up to be huge, and everybody else will go, oops. We, you know, we just, we weren't up in on the ground. may resent that. They may resent the uh, humans who got in their way initially, who like fought them and tried to exterminate them and things like that. That, that could be a conflict. They might like take that personally. Uh, also, a very, very basic conflict is the ends are just a lot better than us, and we may resent that. So uh, many people I've talked to about the scenario, you can also imagine another scenario where you just have smart robots, but they're not conscious, they don't have they don't, aren't like people emotionally, et cetera. They're just these machines that do stuff. People like that scenario better because now the machines don't compete with us. Better. They're just you know machines that, that are you know out there doing stuff. But the emulations they compete with humans for status in the sense that you know whatever you do that you try to be impressive and impress the rest of us with, they're just going to do it a lot better. Uh, they're going to run roughly a thousand times faster than humans on average. Uh, thousand miles an hour. No, no, in terms of you might. productive in this new economy. So they are the typical eliteness of Nobel Prize winners, Olympic gold medalists, billionaires, heads of state. The typical emulation is that good. Much better than you, and they know it. So that's a form of conflict. You may resent that uh, you've lost your job to a species of creatures that thinks they're better than you, and they can show it in a lot of pretty objective ways. Uh, um, will, the, will the M's have their own social competition for status? Of course, yes, absolutely. And how there's also good how will they, I mean, are going to be for some marginal battles over? There's, sure. So one interesting thing is that when they're young, uh, they can be trained a few copies, and so they can have very expensive training, and then they can make many copies that go on to uh, live productive work lives. So while they're young, they may compete to, like, do really impressive things so that they can lord it over everybody when they're older, see? So, you, you know, they can spend a lot of money making, uh, you know, very impressive achievements when they're young to be high set. Uh, but they'll just have all the usual status things, really. Uh, they'll use highfalutin language. You know, they will brag about where they've traveled. They, <laughs> they'll brag about who they know. So actually, it's easy for anybody to meet an M celebrity. The hard thing is to get the celebrity to remember you. <laughs> Basically, they split off a copy. You interact with their copy, and the copy gets erased after you interact with them. The original celebrity doesn't remember you unless the copy bothers to tell them. So you can all meet with the president. He just won't remember you. Can I ask you a question, Kenshi? Uh, if you do them one at a time and, and give space between the two of them for other people to ask questions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So is, my question is, first question, is there any treatment given to like what is a person and is an M really just a person? Uh, I completely ignore most of the usual questions that people have talked about when this subject comes up for many decades. So the subject is, is, is an old subject in technologists and science fiction and futurism. And when it comes up, the usual topics are, could it even be possible for a machine to emulate a real flesh and blood person? If you made one, would it be conscious? If you made one of me, would it really be me? When would it happen? And I've just ignored all those questions because I thought that was all overdone, way overdone. 
uh, and people have reached diminishing returns, vastly diminishing returns on those topics. And the thing they haven't talked much about is what actually happens if these things show up. So that's why I wrote this book. Well, then, to piggyback off of that, do you go into the legality of it? Like yeah, I have a whole section of law, because I teach law and economics. Uh, but again, the question is, what law would they choose? It's not very interesting to ask, how would our law apply to them? You know, they take over the world, they make things their own way, and the question is, what law do they want? What law works for them? And so I have a discussion about that. So um, this might be a pretty basic question, but if you're just taking a brain, like you're scanning it, and putting it onto a computer, how is it achieving like 2,000 times or 1,000 times uh, faster brain speed than a normal human? Even if it's like Einstein, he, was he 2,000 times smarter than a normal human? So there's smarter and faster. Uh, just in general, when you have a computer running a software program, if you put it on a faster computer, the program can just run faster, the same program on a faster computer. Yeah. When it's a parallel program, which many kind of programs are, especially brains are very parallel, then you can just make more processors and if you double the number of processors running the program, it can run twice as fast. And so that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. So basically, whatever you, but basically, the, the switching time of human brain uh, cells is really vastly less than the fastest electronic switching time we know. So other than a huge range possible for going faster. But all the So he asked, what would the ethics for him I, When people talk about the future, they usually overwhelmingly get focused on what future they would prefer. And they don't spend enough time thinking about what futures are likely if you do nothing. And so I try to correct it by focusing mostly on what will happen, whether I like it or not, whether you like it. Uh, the M's would, of course, have their own ethical sense, and I try to predict that, but I'm not trying to talk about what they should have, what they do have. So for example, uh, they're just much less concerned about death. Today, for us, it's a huge opportunity cost. When somebody dies, there's a lot that's lost that you just can't get back. For M's, if you make a short-term copy that lasts for a short time and then it ends, there's very little lost, and they'll see it that way. There's very little lost, but they will really be really averse to mind theft. If you have an M and somebody steals a copy of it, then they could torture that to get secrets. They could make more copies to have it compete with the original. There's just lots of ways that M plans would just lose a lot of wealth from a stolen copy, so they would be really hyper against that. They would really hate theft and be rallying and, and screaming against it because it's something that they're all really threatened by. If that helps. Uh, you already said that there would be M competition. But will that competition be, you've already just now mentioned a case in which it would not be productive. Will it be productive, uh, will it be welfare improving for them, and will it be welfare improving for people, that competition? Um, for us and for them, there are productive competition and unproductive sure. competition. So all the same mix. There's still unproductive competition for them, but they're in a more competitive world overall, and that reduces unproductive competition. So. Um, Basically, because it's so easy to make copies, uh, basically in a labor market, for example, one better worker could take over an entire job category. They could just keep making copies of themselves and just do all of those jobs just because they're better at it. And so uh, that happens in product markets today. Uh, you know, firms are able to compete and take over a whole industry. The more easy it is for a more efficient firm to take over more of an industry and gain more because of that, then the stronger competitive pressures are. So, in our world, we actually have, like, I, I believe the figure is between the 90th and the 10th percentile of factory productivity in the U.S., it's a factor of two. Do they have antitrust? Yes, they can. Okay. Um, sure. Okay. Actually, more interestingly, um, so you probably know that one of the major things that made the modern world work was reducing the use, the strength of reliance on family clans. So uh, starting with the Roman Empire, uh, reducing cousin marriages, you know, the Catholic Church had a lot to do with it reducing the importance of family clans so that, and that allowed us to rely more on firms and cities and in those firms and cities and nations have more of an allegiance to those units and playing fair with those units rather than just favoring our families. Uh, that actually took a long time to happen and in much of the world it still doesn't happen very well. In much of the world still there's really high degrees of family clans. In the M world, all the copies of the same original M have more allegiance naturally than even identical twins would today. 
And so that becomes a strong, attractive unit of finance and politics and law. But now M firms and uh, cities, etc., have to worry about nepotism within family clans. That is, if, if there's somebody in our work group named George, and George wants to hire another George in the work group, we necess can't necessarily trust George to be fair about that. We have to be especially wary of clan nepotism. So that's not quite the same as antitrust, but it's in a sense a bigger concern. That is, uh, but yes, there'd be other sorts of yes. How do you think of M's in dealing with supply, demand, and competition from resources? Since most of the concerns that are driving kind of human competitions in supply and demand, like relations, don't seem that relevant to them. Uh, I mean, so if you don't need a body, you don't there, need There is a subsistence plans. economy. So think about a thousand years ago, uh, a subsistence farm. In a subsistence farming economy, most of what everybody was doing was creating the minimum necessary to survive. So they were growing food, clothes, heat, shelter, things like that. In this emulation economy, most of what they're doing is creating the minimum required for emulations to exist because it is a Malthusian subsistence world for them. That means they're mostly building computers, maintaining them, supplying them with energy, supplying them with cooling, structural support, communication lines, real estate. That's where most of the work is going because that's what they mostly need to survive and it's a subsistence economy. So they are competing to be better at supplying those basic needs to the rest of them. And if you can if you can get one percent more efficient at making a computer or something, you can make a lot of money out of it. Uh, but they're competing on supplying the minimum necessary to exist. Uh, do you think, or if you, if you don't think this, why um, why not? You know, uh, Nick Brostrom has talked about you know the, the idea of like, what if it's like a you know a Disneyland with no children? Is this sort of metaphor of if you have a society with the M's, you know, they can self-modify. Well. Want to be more economically efficient for them to sort of like eliminate all the aspects of you know mentality that they that aren't that aren't necessary for what they do. So like the, the example, the joking example is like a contract drafting lawyer, you know, and you know he decides you know even he knows the efficient thing is just to, to eliminate every aspect of human mental functioning that doesn't have anything to do with with drafting contracts. It doesn't have any desire to like you know happiness or anything like that. It just it just drafts contracts because that's what's more efficient than trying to focus on anything else. So uh, would, would something like that happen? Would there just be like uh, less, uh, I'm sorry, more focus, less general minds? Or? So um, one way to think about this is, I'm very clear, I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to tell you about the entire history of the universe for a trillion years. I'm only trying to tell you plausibly what the next era after ours looks like that's as different from our era as our era looks from the farming or foraging era as it came before that. Plausibly, this next era, the economy would double roughly every month, and if it were to last, last through as many doublings as the previous recent eras have had, it would last a year or two, and then something else might happen. <laughs> okay, and I'm not telling you what happens next. So that's the main reason to feel insecure about the future. I can tell you that plausibly, you can, things can go well at this time, but I don't tell you what happens next, and this doesn't last that long. So I think during the early parts of this era, again, Human minds are by far the most valuable thing on the planet today. We, we've been trying for a long time to write software. We can't replace it. We have all these animals out there, and they have nearly human brains, but they've become pretty useless uh, <laughs> by comparison to substituting for people. We also know that in the human brain, most of the tasks that people do recruit several different modules in the brain. So it's not really hard, it's hard to tell which modules you could get rid of that wouldn't be used by any of the tasks that most people do on their job. Uh, eventually, in the long run, of course, it's possible that uh, these things would just be completely redesigned, but uh, I, I have learned over the years the great respect of legacy systems and uh, what happens when a, a lot of knowledge is embodied in, a, embodied in a very complicated, messy thing. Those things often last a long time, so uh, especially when they're the most valuable things around. And the human mind can be thought of as that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's where all this important knowledge is embodied. It's really a big mess. Very torn and complicated, but that's one of the reasons it'll be hard to replace. It's just a big, complicated legacy system, and you mostly, for a while, have to just take it as it is. So, like, what resources will the M's not mind us having, right? Because, like, you know, oh, well, we're, what is easy? we're the M's of our time, right? For sure. We, we, don't, we don't really care that we give bird food to birds. So, for there, are still, <laughs> there, are still right. bird there are still foragers in our world. Why are they still there? because they're using parts of the wild that nobody else wants. That's basically why there are still foragers in our world. When loggers decide they want it, then those people are in trouble. But there are still a few places where nobody wants that. 
unfortunately for, the, for us, the emulations mostly want to cram into a very small number of very dense cities. We are spread across many hundreds of cities on the planet because we have a limit on how big we can make cities before traffic, traffic congestion makes them not so useful. Emulations, that traffic congestion limit goes much, much lower, so they can concentrate into a much smaller number of much denser cities. This means they are mostly crammed into a half dozen or so, uh, you know, less than 100 kilometer sized cities on the planet, so most of the rest of the planet they don't want. You can have until they want it later on, in which case <laughs> you won't. So again, if they're doubling every month, you have to realize, you know, it's, 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 less, it's not that many years before they might take over the whole planet. But still, when that happens, it's past the end of my scenario deadline. See, so I only want to talk about a scenario, and then after that, I'm not going to tell you what happens. <laughs> yeah. um, what assumptions did you make about human development during this time period? Oh, that's really easy. Remember, this period only lasts a year or two. <laughs> So, to the emulations, it lasts for thousands of years because they're running a thousand times faster than humans, roughly. But to humans who can't speed up, this entire era lasts a year or two. So, it's easy to tell you what happens. All of a sudden, humans lose their ability to work for wages. Boom. They almost retire. Then, all of a sudden, all their investments start doubling every month. Boom, 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 boom. So, the ones who have investments, they suddenly get really rich. And within a year or two, they just can't change their culture very much. Their music doesn't change, their fertility happens, they don't have lots more children, they, they just, they, they can't go on huge space colonization ventures. None of that can happen in a year or two. So, it's easy to say humans just don't change much in this time. That's it. But I mean, while they're building the uh, technology to make these ends, wouldn't they also be building technology that would in increase human, um, our own capacity, like inserting like robotic chips into our minds to help us accelerate thinking and other things? Like, they might, but whatever they do at the beginning of this era probably is roughly what they have at the end of this era. It doesn't change much in two years. Because they can't do many trials in two years, etc. Is that a hand up there? Yeah, what, what does AM's relationship with politics look like? Is there any participation by AM's? Or? Right. They run their own politics, so... Very quickly, the emulations run their own world, basically. The humans are too distant to have much impact or be able to run things, so the emulations have to run their own world. Uh, I can tell you... A democracy gets reduced somewhat, and especially one M1 vote doesn't work at all. Speed-weighted speed voting might work, but there's several reasons why uh, non-democratic leaders are actually more effective in this world relative to our world, so they would probably move somewhat in that direction. Uh, I'm talking a lot about how like, our investments will double, but I mean, it's like, buy all my investments in Microsoft or Apple, I assume that the average are going to be running Microsoft and Apple and making them bigger. Like, will we be investing in and company, and run companies, or? Yeah. Well, you can invest in patents useful in the world, companies, real estate, whatever things uh, are valuable in this world, you can invest in plausibly. That, that's what happens in our world, too. So, uh, yes? So, uh, processing speed is increasing a lot. For the, it's much faster than for humans, but yes. uh, the length of a day isn't increasing, yep. and the amount of time it takes for certain, certain resources to develop isn't necessarily increasing. What kind of constraint does the, the, the natural paces of these other physical processes play? What, what constraints do those paces put on M development? So, in an economy that could plausibly double every month, if there was a key ingredient that was hard to increase fast, either that shuts down the whole thing and they can't grow faster, or they put a lot of resources into that thing to find a way to either grow it faster or do without it. So, for example, uh, there are many specialized kinds of metals, uh, rare earth metals, that we often use in computers today. If those are too, take too long to get to or dig up, then they can make computers out of other materials. We already know about how to make many kinds of computer-like material processes out of more ordinary materials. We use these special materials because they help in our world when we can get this material faster, but they would just be willing to do without it if they needed to, because you know the opportunity cost of waiting is so huge, they would just not wait. But the, 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 what are you touching on before? With energy, for example, it takes a very long time to actually ramp up production. Uh, like you, 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 there's not that many ways you can build a nuclear reactor in faster than like 12 months. Then I can show you that that's a whole regulation. No, I'm not saying regulation. So, to the extent large, complicated things take a long time in our world and you can't speed that up, they won't use them. They'll use simple, small things you can make fast, like solar cells or something else. Whatever, they'll do whatever they need to to keep things going fast because there's a huge, you know, delay. In our world, the our economy doubles roughly every 15 years. 
So that's roughly a 4% growth rate. That's on the order of our interest rates for our investment projects. When we see an investment project that takes 30 years, we say, no, that's just not worth it. We find another way to do things. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that they could find a way to do most of the things they need to do in fast ways, but that might, for example, tall buildings might just happen less. That is, they could get a lot of advantage about building a very tall building in their city, but if tall buildings take a lot longer than a month, they may just, just do without them. They say, fine, we'll just spread out more because we can't afford to spend the time to build a tall building. So, oh, is that me? Okay. Yes. So, uh, police dogs, guide dogs, they make great family pets. They're really well trained. Um, so, who would you pick to be the Sarah McLaughlin for retired animals? Sarah who? You know, <laughs> seriously, you've never seen the TV commercials begging for like money yeah. for like the animals that need shelter? No, so you're asking about a pitch person ask, begging for money? Yeah, for, so again, for animals that are about to be retired and need a place to go, but the corporation clearly doesn't want to pay because they're obsolete. And don't so, emulation retirement is cheap because they can retire slow. So. The cost to run an M is proportional to its speed. So if the typical emulation state is running a thousand times human speed, if it wants to retire at human speed, that only costs one thousandth of the runtime. So it's relatively easy to save enough. Of. So basically, uh, if you don't save enough for retirement, you just have to have a slower retirement. Well, you know. If you want to have a higher status retirement where you run faster, you'll have to save a bigger nest egg. But there's no way, you're not going to die, you're just going to go slow. Sorry about, you know, so there's less of a, oh my god, I'm about to die if you don't pay for me sort of thing. Because we know, no, you're not going to die, you're just going to be slow. The back? Uh, I sent you this article uh, a few days ago about uh, speculation that the biological force that we are nowadays, that we are reminiscent of some AI artificial intelligence that So there's two very different elements of you you think you're talking about won't we later on want to return to the past won't we get tired of the future and want to go back to the old ways just like we've always done in the past uh, it's right every few hundred years we get tired of living in civilization and we go back to forging in the woods and civilization falls apart and wanders away because we all go back to the woods. We do it on weekends. <laughs> well, uh, so there's one claim is that biological systems are just inherently more efficient than electronic systems. I mean, there are some parameters by which they're better today, but plausibly, you know, the electronic systems can just keep getting better and beat those things. Uh, the idea that we'll just get bored and want to go back to the old ways, I mean, the standard story is you know, our old styles of life only supported low density in the world. Now that we have a lot more density, the only way to go back is to lose a lot of people. And uh, basically that doesn't happen because places that keep a lot of people, then there's a conflict, they win. So it's just really hard to imagine everybody going back to the old ways uh, once a new, more efficient way shows up. It's just, it's just not plausible. Uh, so if you are assuming that like you're not cutting any part of the brain out, that you're like, because we, you, like we don't know how to do that? So, and yours. Well, to, I'm to firstly th saying it doesn't make that much difference, but I can tell you what the most plausible things to cut are. So, in our minds, a very large fraction of our brain volume is devoted to high resolution vision and high resolution hearing. Plausibly, for most jobs, we don't need high re that high a resolution. So, plausibly, we could just shrink those regions, just reduce the resolution of our sight and hearing, and save maybe half of brain volume. Uh, that's a plausible thing they'll do. But once they do that, the rest of the book hardly changes. It's all still in the same scenario, now just with another factor of two savings and cost. And, yep? Um, so, like, let's say we're smart about it and we, like, keep it shut off to the internet and don't give it power. We're just feeding information manually to do tests that are really hard. Um, how long do we have for M's to work for us before we work for M's? Um, we don't work for M's. Either we have retirement savings that they let us spend in their world, or we die. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the buffer? Uh, so in your scenario, and we don't need to own them. Uh, in history, when wages were high because labor was scarce, that was the time it was most valuable to own slaves, uh, because you could feed a slave for cheaper than it would cost to hire a laborer. When wages fell to near subsistence level, it cost about as much to. To, to pay a free laborer as it did to feed a slave, there wasn't so much point in owning a slave. This is such a scenario. 
So I'm not saying they can't have slaves. There's just less of an influence on slaves. So more likely, with lots of them out there, they're all competing with Serbians, so you get two services, you don't need to enslave them, so you don't. They probably work a little better, better motivated if you don't enslave them. So uh, maybe uh, you let them work for, for free, you let them be free and work for subsistence wages for you. Uh, but, you know, that's because you have money to spend. If you don't have money to spend on them, somehow you lost it, you threw it away, you let it, you, you know, whatever, then, then you're in trouble. Because they have all these great services you can't afford for it, you can't really do much they, that they want. So, uh, yes? Is there a possibility that uh, an M or possibly an entire uh, subtype of M's would become, say, like radical Islamists or some sort of yes. fringe group? <laughs> how, how, would you de- how would you describe sure. like the aftermath of that kind of scenario? So first of all, just the world is huge. This world is even huger. It's a high-dimensional space. There's just lots of tales of distribution. There's lots of ways people can be weird on the tales of distribution. Being religious fundamentalists is certainly one of those possible ways. Uh, there's actually plausible reasons why re- religion might have a resurgence here relative to our world, uh, because it's functional in many ways, but even setting that aside, sure, there'll be tales of distribution, but they're mostly poor tales, so if you're imagining some sort of extreme sect, you have to imagine what they do when they're really poor, and uh, they need to work a lot to survive, but th- their religion may help them uh, bond together in a community, uh, devote themselves more to their task, uh, not give up, etc. That's often worked in the past for poor communities, using religion to bind themselves together, so they probably would too. Chris? How do you understand that? Well, first of all, better because uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're just they're just you know Nobel Prize winner quality people, etc. So uh, they're just better able to think through that stuff. But plausibly, they do it the way we do, uh, i.e., mostly ways to rationalize what they want to do anyway. Are there any big trends in terms of beliefs that you would predict for M's that be different? So somebody asked that earlier. I, I said uh, less. They're less concerned about death, more concerned about mind theft. Right. Okay. Uh, those are plausible ways that their ethics change. But, you know, if, if you want to hear a good rationalization, they're just going to be much better at it. They, they will have a far more articulate and clear, well thought through rationalization for whatever they want to do than you, you can possibly imagine. Wouldn't, uh, what, what, for what reason would an M want an economy to grow or want innovation to occur if they're already operating at, like, better than human levels, and they ha- they themselves have sufficient uh, like computing space. There's no particular, I, I don't, is there a particular reason why they would want more versions of themselves to propagate in the world, or different, newer, better version than they currently are of them in the world? So, so through most of history, uh, the society the world was at a subsistence level. Mm-hmm. Uh, innovation still happened, uh, and stuff happened, but people were very poor. Just the last few hundred years is this unusual exception. I'm saying we go back to the old ways uh, in this new era. Basically, all through history, people needed to have a much, enough motivation to do what they needed to survive. If they couldn't find that motivation, they died. But all the people you saw that kept on had enough motivation to do their job and do, you know, raise children and do whatever it took to keep that society going. That's also true here. Emulations can have a thousand different motives for what they're doing. The key thing is, those who have enough motive to do what the world needs them to do, they exist and thrive, and the others don't. And so uh, they will do it for a thousand different reasons. Just like in our world, people go to work for a thousand different reasons. You ask them in the morning, why are you going to work? You'll hear a thousand different reasons. The key thing is, they show up at work. And that makes the world keep going. If they don't show up at work, then stuff bad stuff happens to them. All right, so if the animals eventually just take over all the world, so... So that's a, well, I guess your scenario doesn't go through there. But well, let's say that the M's are becoming super much better than humans. They already are. So what are the odds that it's eventually just going to lead to M spreading into the rest of the universe? Eventually is a very, you know, long, so I'm talking about a short term, not saying eventually, but. Well, so, yeah, long term is more interesting. <laughs> but I don't know that they stay M's. That is, if we change into M's, then M's may change into something else. I could say, whatever their descendants becomes have a decent chance of spreading out and becoming powerful. But I don't know what they become, because I'm only telling you about this era and what they are during this era, and not what they are next. So it's very plausible that their descendants in some way take over the universe, but then that's true about us as well. Our descendants, plausibly, eventually become that. But what exactly they become, that's harder to say. Who knows what they become, right? Uh, Why would... We think religion be plausible in this scenario. Why would what religion? Why are we certain that religion be plausible? Uh, well, first of all, uh, religion really survived the Industrial Revolution just fine. 
The Industrial Revolution was the last enormous change we had that changed society in so many different ways, and religion seems to have sailed right through that pretty well. But it's, it's not as important to the average individual as it is today. If you, if you right. talk to the average young English peasant uh, in a, the 10th century, they would be more religious today than probably an ISIS number. In many ways. Not really, actually. Re read some history. Uh, they weren't really that religious. Uh, but uh, I, have a, I recommend a book called Montelieu, uh, just as a side note. It's uh, basically a, um, a guy who was going to become, uh, who was a bishop who was going to become pope. He tried to make a name for himself, which he did, by having a big inquisition of a town in southern France. And he basically spent several years t uh, interviewing everybody in great detail. And so it's this great record of an ordinary village, except for the fact that they were heretics, talking about their lives from their own point of view, a uh, you know, very thorough survey of what they all thought and said, and they are really uh, a lot different than people would say. So another thing is our best theory about why spirituality evolved into religion is that the farming world could make use of stronger social pressures to get people to do the weird things that the farming world needed that people didn't, natural, didn't find natural. And so uh, those, that need is there in the, in the emulation world as well. That is, they have new, act, new behaviors they need to do that they don't find natural and that social pressures of religion will be useful for. It's also true that even in our world, more productive people tend to be more religious. So there's just a straightforward correlation between productivity and religion, religious behavior, and because this is a selection for the most productive among us, they're probably going to be more religious. Uh, so that's several related factors. All right, so you seem to say that atoms will take over the world, so why don't we make atoms that will kick us out? <laughs> I know, like, maybe employers think they're more productive or something, but realistically, so, it seems like government would probably handle something like this, you know, BM licenses or something like this. So, so. so, for a very long time, no one has been in charge of technology. Uh, technology has just arrived when it was possible. Yeah, but and like then, M's. come on. The government's it, not going to For most part, it. <laughs> it's very rare that we ever bother to try to coordinate to prevent a technology that was possible. It's happened on rare occasions, relatively small things, which have a number of easy characteristics. This is much harder. This is the sort of thing that if you use it in the way you could use it, you can make trillions of dollars. Not billions, trillions. There's that much money on the table. So uh, it'll, it would require very strong global coordination to suppress and most likely um, Right, you, know, you know that they're going to take that out of the end, right? But you also ask, well, why oppose this, right? Yeah. You, sh you could think of the M's as your descendants. You don't have to think about the flesh people <laughs> they're not as your descendants. People. That's a choice. Some people will think their way, some people will think other ways. So, uh, you think, of, is not the first think about a thousand years, think about 400 years ago, as the Industrial Revolution was getting started, you had children, you lived on a farm, you could ask yourself, do I, how am I going to fight this industrial world so that I can save my farming children from being taken over by those industrialists? You could have said, that's going to be really hard. We'll have to go to the mountains. We'll have to you know, collect together our, our stakes to make weapons or whatever. Or you could say, I want my children to join the industrial world so they can be successful there because I want my children to become part of whatever the successful new thing is. And in fact, most people did that second strategy. Most people said, I want my children to join the new world and be successful there rather than my children are by definition farmers, therefore they must flee with me to the mountains as this industrial world takes over. You just throw a wrench in the works. Doesn't that fix everything? No. <laughs> that didn't uh, work for industrial, yes. I, I think you're passing up your best possible marketing campaign. Which you is? have to read Robin Hansen's book uh, across the end so we're going to take over. Right. <laughs> so, I, I definitely, I'm not trying to tell you you shouldn't try to stop it. I'm, I really do want to just take this positive tone of saying, I'm going to tell you what the strange future's like. You don't have to, it's not my job to make you like it. It was my job to just go see it and describe it to you. But your publisher's job should be to make everyone else hate it. Right? <laughs> more, they're more interested in, like, destroying it than, like, using it to their personal advantage. You might think, hey, if this is going to happen, how can I help, how can I, I win? Make money off of the exactly. How can I drive and prosper in this new scenario, right? Um, so I think that, right, that in order to emulate a human, a human mind, we are, it's almost like impossible to get that many transistors on a certain processor, like just, you know, physics-wise, you can't get the atoms that small, and we're it's orders of magnitude away from ever getting to this point and recreating the human mind. Impossible to so, as you may know, standard Moore's law trends, uh, many things like energy. It seems like, like 
if you could, and I whatever you call them slaves, or if you have them, like, you just all coordinated together, like, you know, whoever makes the first M or the, the, the people, you know, the, the whatever M's making copies of themselves, I mean, instead of each M sort of optimizing to maximize its own self-interest, if they were, you know, if they would, if they were like collectivist stems, right, and they, they would do everything, you know, for the good of the collective, then it seems like they would, they would, that would out-compete everything else. What you'd have is some kind of, you know, collectives instead of, you know, individuals, uh, individual limbs sort of so, doing their own thing. Today and in the past few centuries, many people have created organizations to try to achieve collective benefits. These are firms, churches, uh, cities, nations, and they have sometimes been smaller than was most efficient, and other times they've been larger than was when was most efficient. Many organizations have diseconomies of scale of organizations, such that when you try to organize something on a larger scale, it gets less efficient. And over time, we've slowly gotten better such that we can manage bigger organizations. That is, in fact, one of the great achievements of the industrial era is that we have managed to have bigger organizations. But it is going slowly, and we, for example, are not really remotely ready to have a world government at the moment. Uh, it, we're just not up to the task, and slowly we'll get better at perhaps having more things we could do at a larger scale, but we're just too far away from that. So until there's a really huge change, I just don't see the entire world coordinating to promote the number of M's or their wages or something like that. That just seems a bridge, several bridges too far. We, we just, we're just not up to that. We've, it's like the coordination of, 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 of the whole world, but like each M, I mean, why would you want to create M's that would maximize their own interest instead of doing you wanted to do, you know? Uh, I mean, it seems like that's... Well, if you ever have children, you will ask yourself that question. <laughs> Why do I let these children have a mind of their own? Why do I let them decide what they want? I have a plan for them. Why don't they just stick with my plan? But turns out it's hard to manage. But, 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 you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't make your children like fall, like, you know. Yes, you can't make your children do what you want. And you can't make your employees do everything you want. And you can't make M's do everything you want. Well, it seems like it would be very, like the technology for controlling them that way would be a lot, would be a lot easier. I mean, like, Why? Well, you can monitor everything they do. And, you can and, monitor what your kids do. You can watch them all day long and they still screw up. You know, our ability to control children is not because we can't watch them often. <laughs> Have like I mean I mean of course it's like a satirical thing, but like Brian's Brian's uh, RPG, the the, 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 the Skinnerian dystopia thing, where it's like you yeah. just hit the negative reinforcement button. Sorry, every time I'm cheap enough webcams. Everybody can be watched if you want. It doesn't change our world that much, right? So, when an M makes a copy of itself. Well, so we were talking about how the M's would really like hate when somebody else copies their mind, right? It's without an agreement to share the wages or something like that. Yeah. So then, how would the M react to a copy of themselves making a copy of themselves? Like... So, so this is true in many lines of business. There are businesses where there's a fixed cost, and then there's a marginal cost to produce something. And if you let people selling the project product compete with each other, they might bring the price down to the marginal cost, which won't cover the fixed cost, and you go out of business. So businesses which have a fixed cost need to manage their suppliers and set the prices so that the, pr the competition does not allow the price to go below, below the average cost of the product. Uh, so M supplying labor would have to do the same thing. They'd have to coordinate enough in the labor to say, after they paid for training and marketing or something, the different M's, they have to coordinate enough so that they don't compete enough to bring the price. That's already something we see in standard industrial organization today. Is there cake here? Is that what I'm hearing? There is cake. So what I suggest is at least we take a break for cake. Thank you. Uh, so hold on, hold on before you go. So uh, afterwards, I bet Robin is happy to keep talking with you all night. But they're also going to be party games starting in the basement, which will be emceed by the immortal Fabia Ross. All right. All right.